Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Josh. And this is the Bad at Magic podcast, a podcast about games, life, and other things. And welcome to episode 28. Gotta love even numbers. That's it. That's all I've got. All right. So let's do something <laughs> a little bit different today, Josh, because uh, I, I've kind of been distracted by some stuff going on in my personal life that's much too boring to talk about on this podcast. Um, and you actually just had one of those kind of brainstorm weeks where you had a lot of ideas for the podcast. So I'm going to let you drive today. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up. This is the worst decision that we've made in a long time. I wrote the script for the show, and I am going to get to pick all of the topics we talk about. So, like, lady, like, just go ahead and qu- skip this one. Just go ahead <laughs> and mark it as read or listen to in your favorite podcast player. Give us a good reading and wait another two weeks for a better episode that Ben produces. All right. Go for it. I figured we should start off with a classic Bad at Magic segment, and let's do Bad at Parenting. Okay. So... Uh, I have a story for bad at parenting, and I don't know if it's my bad at parenting or my wife's bad at parenting, but uh, there I was, minding my own business as a grown adult man on a weekend, you know, like mid-afternoon, 2, 3 o'clock. I'm like, you know, I'm a little peckish, so I'm going to go to the pantry. We have a whole shelf dedicated to to quick snacks because we have small children in the house, and so I grabbed a little bag of, uh, of Cheez-Its, right? And I'm pulling the bag of Cheez-Its out of the pantry, and my wife came around the corner, and she used the mom voice. And this is what I want to talk about. The mom voice. The mom voice, where she goes, what are you doing? In just that tone of voice, where it goes straight past your brain and into your spinal cord. Because I... (laughs) I, Did you drop it on the floor? (laughs) I I dropped it. I jumped back, and I was... And I immediately, like, had this scared look, like I had done something wrong. And it took me a second to realize... You're eating food in your own house? Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm a grown man. I can have a snack if I want to. Why do I feel like a a, a startled goat when my wife uses this tone of voice with me? I love the imagery of a startled goat. I've seen so many great videos of, like, goats, like, freezing and falling off of things. Yeah. Oh, the yeah, the goats that pass out or the ones yeah. that scream her. Yeah, yeah. that's okay, exactly so, what so I did. She has a she has a superpower over you. Did you know this? No, I, I don't think it's just her over me. I think it's just that tone of voice. Like it's just you know the people you care about and you spend a lot of time with. They they have their quirks and their personality traits, and that tone of voice has that just that perfect mix, the perfect blend of dissatisfaction disappointment, maybe a little bit of frustration, and I never want that gun aimed at me. And Were you like four years old standing there holding the bag of Cheez-Its when you shouldn't have had it? I don't. I have no idea where this came from. I think it's just built, programmed into my brain. Like I said, it skipped all of the normal processes. Like I didn't even <laughs> like hear you, what she liked, said the first well, you time. you said it. It went straight to my spinal cord. <laughs> so has this ever happened to you? Does your wife have a tone of voice that can just freeze you in your tracks, or is it just me? Um, so when you describe that experience of like having something happen that kind of takes you, passes all your, your reason and your status as an adult, I have other things that make me feel that way. You know, sometimes like, like when I was a kid, I would, I would always disregard my curfew and that was back in the days before cell phones. So the, so the thing would be there, you would be at your friend's house and their telephone would ring and you would think, oh no, it's my mom. (laughs) <laughs> I've stayed too long. She's calling their mom to send me home. And that's that's bad news. Yeah. And there are things I could be doing where that's like my first instinct. You know, I, I stayed out too late or went someplace I shouldn't have been. And then my phone buzzes or rings and I, and I get that feeling I had when I was like 13. Like, oh no, <laughs> it's my mom. So that's just that lingering guilt starting to creep in. Like you realize and kind of acknowledge that you're doing something wrong. And then something happens where you feel like somebody's calling you on it. Yeah, but I guess that requires there to be actual guilt to begin with. And what you're describing, there shouldn't be any. Like, what's what do you need guilt for just getting some cheeses out of the cupboard in your own house? <laughs> well, it, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just a, a horribly weak-willed person. And I'm that, I'm one of those, like, meek, like, caricature husbands you see on TV where I'm just doting on my wife so hard that I just want everything to be perfect for her all the time. And I live oh. in constant fear of her. Well, why did she do it? Oh, no reason. She came around the corner, saw me getting a snack, and wanted one as well. She- she just punked just, you. Yeah, basically. Okay. And she does that same tone to like the kids and stuff. And that that's another problem because now after that happened, I've been more paying more attention to it. And like I hear that voice, her use the voice on the kids in the other room and my hackles start to go up a little bit like, I just want everything to be nice again. I get that too. I definitely get it with that when she's getting on the kids and I'm just, it makes me tense. And I'm like, why does it have to be this way? 
<laughs> I don't know if I have that voice. Like this is, I called it the mom voice because that's what it made me feel. It mm. made me feel like I was a little kid doing something wrong and I had been caught by an authority figure. I don't know if I have a dad voice. Like I have a stern voice that I deal with my children, but I don't know if that carries the same psychological impact that the mom voice does. You know, because I've made a very deliberate decision to be kind of a gentle disciplinarian with my children, you know, no striking and and not a lot of, you know, direct punishment, but more just kind of like a deliberate system of incentives and rewards and encouragement and and support. Uh, (laughs) I realized something that my children, uh, as my three oldest are, you know, getting older and leaving the house and stuff, they've kind of expressed to me in little bits as reminiscing about the past. And that is, as a child, I think they still feel the same emotions of um, failure and disappointment and those kinds of things over bad decisions they've made, even though I haven't been hard on them. You know, none of my kids would ever say, my dad's going to kill me, but they still feel disappointed when they make a bad choice. And they have explained to me later that that's because I'm I'm disappointed in them and that hurts them. And I realize that they're feeling like the same uh, same potency of emotion about me just quietly saying I'm really disappointed in you as it might be if I told them to go get a stick for me to beat them with. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not discredit the stick right out the gates, okay? The, the <laughs> stick has its place. But uh, so it sounds like then your primary parenting tool in your arsenal is disappointment, quiet okay. disappointment. Kind of is, yeah. That's kind of a. I'm gonna say that's kind of a passive aggressive way of dealing with your kids. But no, no, that's there's nothing wrong with that. That is a a passive negative reinforcement of what you're going for. That's that's fine. Um, mine is I, I inherited this from my parents because I don't know any other way of parenting. Right? We all have the same parenting style that our parents had. I think mine is just fear. Like just kind of getting the kid, just like lean into the kid a little bit, and like raise a voice just to scotch me. Like, listen, what you're doing right now is not appropriate, and I don't have, a good, <laughs> I don't know if I have a good dad voice for that. I did that this week, that exact thing this week in the dumbest situation. So I'm sitting in the kitchen, I'm on a telecon, and it's not the kind where I can just sit there and zone out and answer emails. It's the kind where at any moment someone might say my name and have, and the 10 words before that been some very complex question that I'm supposed to know the answer to. So I have to be very focused on what's happening. And I'm noticing out of the corner of my eye as I'm on this telecon that my uh, – 10 year old daughter walks in and puts the tea kettle on the stove and then starts to leave the kitchen. And I know from past experience <laughs> that that thing's going to go full on steam engine, you know, train horn whistle for 15 seconds before she makes it into the kitchen to turn it off. Right. <laughs> and, and so, so, nope, sorry. That's not how this works right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, Samantha, get over here right now. Look at me. And I was kind of risking getting in trouble on the telecon, but I needed to take a second and do it. So I can still hear the telecon going on my ear. I'm like, your time is not more important than my time. You will go over there and you will stand next to the stove and you'll take that kettle off the instant that it is done. (laughs) Do you understand me? You will stand there and you will watch that water boil. (laughs) Yeah. And I was just, but, but I've never had that discussion with any of my kids where I told them that my time is more important than your time and you will not delegate, you know, you're not delegating any tasks to me and you're not going to go in the other room because you don't want to wait for your water to boil and you'll, you'll come when you hear it whistling for 20 seconds. No, no. You see, here, here's the thing. You and I, we have to have discussions with our children. We have to set, these are the expectations. These are the behavior that you are breaking those expectations. And this is how we expect you to progress from this point forward, right? You we and don't I get have, to use mom voice. <laughs> yeah. The mom voice cuts through all of the red tape uh, of that. Okay. And just, they just know that they've screwed up and they know they've got to do better. Okay. So do that exact same situation, but mom's sitting in the chair, kid puts the tea kettle on, starts to walk away. How do you do that with mom voice? How do I do that? I don't know how to do it with mom voice, but <laughs> I imagine. You don't know. We don't, I, yeah, we don't we, superpower. No, but I imagine, I can imagine a scenario in my mind where my wife is in exactly the same thing because our, our computer setup is in the, near the kitchen as well. If my wife was sitting at the computer on a teleconference and my son put a tea kettle on the stove, I can see her in my mind turning him going, hey, and like just that. And then he would look at her and go, Ooh, and like turn everything off and like put everything back the way it was and then back out of the room slowly. <laughs> nice. Dang it. <laughs> well, we'll have to compensate some other way. Yeah, fear. Fear and intimidation. I think it's what it is. Uh, okay. Well, 
that's uh, our discussion about the mom voice. If anybody has experiences with their spouse or their mother, like commanding their emotions from afar, let us know in the comments. Now, right, you, I've got, yeah, you've yeah. got a note in here about not just the slippery slope, but the slippery, slippery slope, which is like another layer of abstraction. I'm very curious what this is. Yeah, so this is this is the kid. I don't know what this morphs into when you become a grown up, but as a kid, there. Uh, I called it the slippery, slippery slope because of an exact incident that happened this week. Uh, at some point, my daughters had been playing out on the trampoline and they put the sprinkler on the trampoline and they realized it was a little bit slippery. And so someone had the idea that it should be more slippery. So they went in the house and got uh, this little bottle of dish soap that we keep next to the sink that's maybe like two ounces. Yes. And they put it on the trampoline and it was a little bit slippery. And that was more fun than just the water. So then that ran out really fast. So then they came back in the house and they got the Sam's Club bottle of dish soap <laughs> and took it out on the trampoline. We are and increasing course, the viscosity and the decreasing the, the friction. Like this is yes. great. This is hard science that's being done here. Yes, yes. Very good science. And they put that all over the trampoline. And of course, they don't just put some of it on. The entire bottle gets used. Like there, there is no one there. It's inevitable. Like when children start down this path, <laughs> unless an adult interrupts them, they are going to consume the entire bottle of dish soap. There's no other core. There's no other outcome. This is an interesting phenomenon that comes across um, two different ideas that I have about children and uh, development as a person. If you want to get into that kind of discussion. That's, that's kind of where I was going with this because I, I started to think about it and I realized that it's always like this. If they're building a fort out of blankets and, and couch cushions, there is no outcome unless an adult intervenes that does not involve every blanket and couch cushion in the house. Which, yeah, that, I mean, that's how these things escalate. But at the same time, that's how these kids learn. So I have a theory that as you get older, you're able to see farther into the future. I may have mentioned this on one of the yes, previous Yes, you have. Go ahead. Podcasts. Expand on it some more. I like, I like that we do this in the podcast, that this is kind of a thread woven for our longtime listeners. Josh has introduced this idea before. Let's develop it now. All right. So the idea being that when you're very, very young, you can't see into the future at all. And so the only thing that matters is maximizing your enjoyment of this moment right now. Okay. And as you get older, the amount of time that you can see into the future stretches more and more and more. That's where kids get excited for their birthday a month at a time, or kids start getting excited for Christmas like halfway through the year. But as an adult, like you, you can keep seeing farther and farther out, and then you start making decisions based on not just now, but what's going to maximize it in the future. Okay, so your kids aren't worried about what's going to happen later. They're not worried about oh, what happens when I go to do the dishes. And I don't have the Sam's Club jug of dish soap. They don't care. All they want to do is maximize the amount of slippery that they have right now. And if a little <laughs> bit of soap makes it a little slippery, then more soap must make it more slippery. Right. All this, the soap is the most possible fun we could be having right now. This and then that coincides with the other idea is that kids don't have any clue about economics in any way, shape or form. Because like like the simple things. My son is eight. And we were watching like a YouTube video. I pulled up a YouTube video about the 10 coolest concept cars for 2019, right? And so it's all that crazy oddball stuff. It's like, oh, this car has carbon fiber skin that flexes as it's driving to cover the wheels and blah, blah, blah. All the coolest looking and awesome technology cars ever. And my son turns to me and asks the question that every kid does. It's like, why don't we have that car? This and concept I concept car that yeah, isn't even in production yet. Right. And I turn to him and I go, you have absolutely no concept of the, the, just the world of information that informs that question. My kid, <laughs> like, That's actually what you said to your eight-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically, I was trying to drive into his head that, like, that question to you is very simple. To me, it's very complex. It's yeah. like, son, like, you're talking about how much money do I make? Do you know how much money we, we budget for the household existence? Do you know how much any of these cars would cost? Do you know that they're not in production yet? Do you have any clue where we would even go to get this thing? Like there are so many things that have to happen between this video and us having that car in our driveway that like you're not even allowed to ask that question. So do you have anything that puts you on the slippery slope? Like if one – if a little bit of dish soap is fun, then all the dish soap is more fun. I mean does anything do that to you anymore or are you just completely graduated? To me? Does it do that to me? Yeah. 
No, Ben, because this is the thing is as adults, like this is almost a definition of adults is we stop the slippery slope. At some point, we like hook the sides or put our hands out and slow down and stop like this is getting a little too slippery. Right. Okay. So let, let, let me demonstrate ridiculousness by being ridiculous. Uh, do you ever go, well, if one bottle of beer makes me feel a little bit buzzed, then how many do I have in the fridge? Oh, Ben, spoken like a person who has never had a hangover in their whole life. <laughs> well, it's those hangovers that inform the decision next time. But yes, and I, I have to have a, a world-ending hangover at least once every two years in order. I have to keep relearning that I, re I was there for one. Yeah, that was – that one you're talking about, that was a world-ending hangover. <laughs> You were all right. So, listeners, this is this is one of the reasons I think Ben is one of the nicest guys on the planet. Is we were talking. It was our trip to Vegas, and we went to the. I told you, you and Nate. I dragged it was when we you. We recorded the first episode of the podcast. I know, and I dragged you to the Hofbrau House, knowing you weren't going to drink a drop. But man, I I got a little loose that night, and like oh, it was it was just bad. I had they never were bringing out those those really tall pints of German beer that's probably you know like 10% alcohol. I had 3 or 4 of those along with all the Jaeger shots. And like I was just that that was the worst hangover hands down that I've ever had in my whole life. And listeners, uh, we woke up like our alarms went off the next morning at 6 o'clock cuz we had to get back to the Magic the Gathering tournament and I told Ben I'm not going to make it and I I went back to sleep and when I woke up 4 hours later what was there waiting for me? But I brought you a, breakfast. A Gatorade, a big bottle of water, uh, one of those travel packs of ibuprofen, and a, a naked fruit smoothie. Like, it was just, it was like, <laughs> it, my mom wouldn't have put out such a great spread for me. Like, that was that was amazing, Ben. Yeah. Well, okay, but I was trying to illustrate the, the slippery slope thing. Like, I was thinking what you said about what is the consequence of using the whole bottle of dish soap. I mean, it's not ec – economically, it's not that much. But what is a kid supposed to weigh against it? Like, do they – it even occur to them – okay, here's the thing. In order for them to get the dish soap outside, they had to get it past me because I was sitting in the kitchen working. Okay. So – at some point, a kid had to go in the kitchen and get the dish soap. And I know for a fact they did not just go in and get it and walk past me holding it in their hand. They did the thing where they're watching me to see if I'm looking and they're holding it behind their back and they're like <laughs> side shuffling through the room. That had to have happened. But this, but you're missing the point of the whole economic surrounding the jug of slippery. Because one, the kids have no idea how it got there. They have no concept where that jug came from how you paid for it, the work that you had to do to earn the money to pay for it, its purpose in their house. Like, they have no idea. They know that there is a giant jug of slippery in this cabinet for reasons that are abstracted from them because they're kids and they don't have to know this crap yet. And they just, but they knew it was a resource available to them. And absent of all of the other reasons that it exists or how it came to be, it seems like a perfectly valid thing to use for their experiment. Okay, so I'm going to take one level deeper on this and kind of play off the fact that you're an atheist. Uh, what <laughs> what is the like evolutionary purpose of this this drive in humans to like escalate something to the maximum extent of pleasure? Oh, I think that's uh, I mean, that, because all the, we want all the good things. Like all of the things that feel good are things that are usually good for us. Or they at least – hang on, hang on. Sometimes it's thrill-seeking. Or... I, I, I threw up my finger because sometimes like it's different. Like Of course, everybody's different. Like we watched that movie Free Solo where that guy climbed El Capitan with no ropes. Yeah. And he was stoked for it. And I'm just sitting on the couch like I thought I was going to die watching, <laughs> watching the movie. So yeah, obviously – a really dangerous thing to do. Yeah, and obviously we weigh that differently in our minds. But he uh, derived a bunch of value from that. Mm -hmm. Um so in prehistoric times, because you got to remember, we're still we're running on uh, the point one version of the hardware that developed, you know, eons ago. If you believe the things that I believe, if you believe that, you know, people existed at the same time as dinosaurs, like, yay, verily, they're they're men. Then that's different. But when we were first came out of the primordial soup, we were programmed certain ways because that made gave us a leg up from our competition. The reason that we like things that are sweet is because the only things that were sweet back in the day were fruits and vegetables, which are good for you and provide lots of other nutrients. We've now evolved technology to the point where, oh, it's not the fruit that's sweet. It's the sugar in fruit that's sweet. Let's take the part that we like and put that into this cake that's fluffy and delicious. Right. Like, this is just an abstraction of that. This is just okay. – and, and, of course, again, it all goes back to these are kids, and this is how kids learn, like through just hardcore – 
exploration yeah, of their surroundings I and curiosity. I, just, I, I wring my hands as an annoying grown up sometimes, but other times I, I just kind of get a kick out of it watching them, you know, b- build a couch cushion forwards or, or jump on, have a soapy mess on the trampoline. Now, this is the other side of that. And I want to ask you, have you ever let that know? I've seen it happening in process and let it go to fruition just to to topple their house of cards. For example, did you allow them to get every blanket and every cushion out of the entire house to make the, the couch cushion for it? Let them play with it for a while. And then when they were done and walking away from it, go, oh, no, clean all this crap up, please. And then just watch their whole world come crashing down on their faces. Like, what do you mean we have to clean all this up? I have trouble remembering the first time because we're already so far down in the iterations of this. I'm with my younger children. I've already been through this with the older children that have already left the house. So I don't know. You know, my kids build the, the every couch cushion and fort in the house on Sunday afternoon when they know that I'm napping because it's the only way they can get away with it. Interesting. I like this this recurring theme that we're discovering that your kids are doing stuff deliberately without your supervision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I won't allow it. I, I see it. If I see them doing the couch cushion thing, I cannot stop myself. I cannot do what you just described. I'd be like, that's enough. You have enough couch cushions. Stop now. You can continue playing your game, but you may not go get the pillows off my bed. You can continue playing your game, but you cannot have the couch cushion that I'm sitting on. <laughs> so, well, and I'm not going to judge because you have way more kids. So when you're talking about, like, <laughs> it would escalate. Like, I can only imagine, like, the, the like if we charted the escalation over time. Like the slope of yours is way steeper than mine because I've got two kids that I can keep an eye on at all times. If I had like a small, like six of them, I can't imagine the amount of just sheer work that they could get done if they put their minds to something. Uh, Or the amount of sheer mess that they can make if they put their minds to it. So so anyway, I, I... came across as a, as a huge, you know, like killjoy. And I'm not, I, sometimes I really get a kick out of just watching them play their games. Like I'll look out the window and see them jumping on the trampoline with, with the uh, dish soap. And I'll be like, well, it's too late for that bottle of dish soap. I'll have to go get another one. And I'm not going to just bust them now. I'll wait until they're done. And then we'll talk. Dude, what's really funny is um, I, the other thing is like being a guy, like I can't help, but like my wife always jokes that she's got three kids because I'm sometimes they're the, <laughs> Like 90% of the time, I'm the adult. Like, hey, let's shut this down, clean up, get everything done. But there's that 10% of the time where my kids get me sucked in too. And yeah. I don't know how that happens, but like I'm imagining the trampoline it's scenario. It's what I said. It never really goes away. It's still in there somewhere. Well, and this is what I'm thinking because like if we had a trampoline and my kids put the, the sprinkler on it and then they do a slippery and they got the dish soap. Um, I also have a, blo- a bucket of like pure gly- gly- glycerol. Is yes. That what it is? All like, right. You – you reminded me of a story. I, this is a good one. <laughs> so when I was 16, we moved to Northern Illinois and we moved into this farmhouse. It was part of my dad's job. He was like a ranch hand. And one time, a buddy of mine and myself, I think we were 17, uh, came over and we'd gone to the grocery store and we bought some dry ice and we'd gone out to the shop and we were trying to put it into a two liter bottle. Ooh, bad news. And, and my dad rounds the corner and he looks at us. And I thought, I thought I'm done. You know, like we're, we're like making a freaking bomb here and, and he's totally going to bust us. And he looks at us and he goes, that's not the right way to do it. (laughs) And my brain was like, say what now? And he's like, let me show you. So he took us over to the welding torch and he filled our two liter bottle with acetylene from the welding torch and oxygen. And then he, and then he proceeded to build a freaking blasting cap. I didn't know my dad knew how to build a blasting cap. He took some match heads and he crushed them up and then he rolled them up in some paper and he coiled some wire through it and then poked it through the the, the lid of the two liter bottle and hot glued it in place so that it would create a seal. And, <laughs> and then we rode a canoe out in the middle of the lake, tied it to a rock, threw it over, and then used a car battery to initiate this acetylene bomb that we made. And it blew up under the water in the pond and it was the coolest thing my dad has ever done. <laughs> We well, see, but this is, that's, yes, that is exactly what I'm talking about. One, the slippery slope never goes away. And two, that's kind of dad's job sometimes. Yeah, is to I like, agree. Like, as your kids, like, oh, every once in a while you get those golden no, opportunities. You're trying to make a bomb. Let me show you how to really yeah, make a bomb. Your kids are having this level of fun. It's like, you, know, you just got to lean over and be that drug dealer. Do you want to take this to the next level? <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> uh, I remember um, we do Nerf gun fights every Christmas. Uh, it's it's a long story. Don't get me started. But like it's, it's escalated to wait. When you say we, you're talking about like your parents. Yes, my, my at my father's house, 
at my parents' house when they do Christmas. It's usually Christmas Eve or a couple of days after was ever most convenient. He will. It started as just a fun game where everybody came with Nerf guns and shot at each other for a little bit. Haha. Ha. It then it has escalated to he has to um, seal all of his smoke detectors with plastic or else they'll go off constantly because he floods his house with two artificial fog machines and strobe lights. No. And he has rock music blaring at full volume. And everybody has multiple Nerf guns. There are thousands Dude, of guns. Dude, I've got to take part in this. <laughs> it, so it's, I'm planning a trip around this tradition. Don't, no, I'm, we can talk about this on another episode, but it is the, the era of the Nerf gun fight is waning right now for, uh, for lots of uh, reasons. I missed, I missed the heyday. I missed the golden age. Right. Well, so one year, my son, like, uh, you know, we have Amazon boxes because who doesn't have Amazon boxes everywhere? And he like right. hold, held up a box and he's like, look at this. I could use this as a shield for the Nerf gun fight. And I leaned down to him. I'm like, oh, son, we can do so much better. And I made him <laughs> like like a full Iron Man suit of Amazon boxes. Yes. Like, it was it was garbage, right? It was just like a box and then I cut holes for the All right, we need a photo boxes. of that for the show notes. Did you take a picture of it? I don't think I did because like I whipped <sighs> it together in a couple hours before we were going to go over there. And he ended up not wearing it. I don't even remember the reasons why. But I'm like, kid, you got to do it. You're going to be impervious to Nerf darts. And he didn't want to do it. He was just that young enough age where he's a little bit out of his comfort zone. Like, I don't know. Him and Hod. It was fine. I ended up taking the remnants of uh, the cardboard I had, and I made a riot shield for myself. I use, I put that to good use that day. Not me. Now, I'm, when my dad leans over and says, let me show you how to make a real bomb, I was like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> my kid's still young. Give him time, Ben. Give him time. Yeah. All right. While we're on the topic of adults knowing how to do more things than their, their kids know how to do, now, one of the things I put in the show notes that I recognized about myself the last couple of weeks is the ability to pick up and learn a new skill has changed. Like, I remember when I was a kid, and, like, my parents told me this at one point, and looking back, it's absolutely true. Back when we were kids, Ben, if you didn't know something or your parents didn't know something, it was just unknown. Like, there was no way to find or get that information right now. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Like, now, did, did your family have a set of encyclopedias in the house? We did. We had an encyclopedia set that um, it was at the grocery store, was putting out like three volumes on a big pallet in the front every week for, you know, like a year to get the whole set, apparently. And we had that whole nice match set of encyclopedias that were horrendously out of date by the time we got the whole set. Yeah. Do you remember what, what brand they were? I think it was Britannica. Okay. We had the world book. Okay. But I love I loved those encyclopedias. But I also knew, I, I learned very quickly that most of the things I was going to have a question about weren't the kind of things you could find out in, in the encyclopedia. Or if they were in the encyclopedia, it was like a half page, the most diluted top level essay that you could even imagine. Yeah. Well, think how, how easy it is to find things out now. Like, um, who's, who sings that song? You know, like an encyclopedia is worthless for that kind of question. It's true. And that's the thing. The, the contrasted to now, where we, we you may have had access to encyclopedia with the most generalized topics possible. Transition to now, where we literally carry around the sum total of human knowledge in our pocket everywhere we go. Right. And so that changes how we learn stuff. And so I was recognizing that in myself this week because I picked up a new hobby on the side and just watching YouTube videos of I don't know why or how this got into my feed, but this uh, guy This is this is the lock picking thing. The lock picking lawyer, yeah. I don't know why, yeah. but he showed up in my feed. I watched one of his videos and I found it just I don't know, interesting. He's got a good voice, he's a cheery guy. Uh it's very mechanical and very detail oriented. I don't know. It's something it just clicked enough of the triggers in my brain that I kept watching. And uh -huh. apparently I watched enough of them in the last couple of weeks. Um my birth my birthday was earlier this week. And yeah. Happy I get a uh, my thank you. Uh, my wife gives me a present and I open it and what is it but a, a set of like a dozen clear acrylic locks, all of different types with different types of keys and a huge set of beginner's lock picks. Nice. Yeah, and so I've been spending a couple she, of nights. Once again, she proves her uh, a plum at being a great gift giver. Yeah, exactly. Because I've spent hours like we'd be sitting on the couch watching TV and I've got this stupid six pin. Uh, just normal padlock and just picking that thing the whole night. And it's just really interesting and I enjoy doing it and it's been super fun. But this is like, how, how, how would you even have been able to get started with that without access to like the internet or YouTube? 
All right, I, I want to hit timeout for just a second, and I'm going to put a question out to our listeners. If your significant other was to buy you a gift for your next birthday by walking past you and looking over your shoulder at what kind of YouTube videos you were watching, <laughs> what would they get you? All right, go ahead and resume. I started thinking about all the things that I've learned from YouTube and the internet, like uh, cooking. Like I remember when I graduated college and drove across the country to move into my bachelor apartment, my mom gave me a, a printout of a dozen different recipes of stuff that she made and two cookbooks. And now, like whatever you want to eat, it's like, oh, what do we got? And like you can just punch in the ingredients into Google and it will give you a dozen different recipes that have those ingredients and you can make whatever you want. And then you yeah. just – my wife has a has this enormous list of bookmarks for all the different baking recipes that she has. Just I don't even I don't know how she categorizes in her head that she knows what recipes she even has access to. Okay, I want to gi I want to give a life hack I have here. It, it, it's a good one. If you've ever been annoyed by trying to Google a recipe and then trying to filter through the stupid nonsense that are that are most of the top results for recipes, where it's filled with like someone's you know story of their childhood or whatever like that. If it's an ingredient. If the recipe you're trying to make can have a commercially recognizable ingredient, most major food companies publish like nonsense yeah. free recipes on their sites. So if you want to make something, just throw in a brand name of one of the ingredients. Like if you know it has cornstarch in it, don't just search uh, for like uh, um, pumpkin yeah. pie. Search for Clabber Girl Cornstarch Pumpkin Pie, and then you'll get a recipe published by the manufacturer that has none of that nonsense in it. That is a good life hack. That's my life hack. That's a good one. Well, in, it's not just cooking, but like also auto repair is the other thing that I thought of. Like I have no, I have zero inclination when it comes to cars. I have no idea. Like I, I, I all right. So I have the highest level intellectual understanding of the mechanical engineering behind how cars work. But if you tell me to actually go do something or diagnose a problem with my car. Not going to happen. That said, I have successfully replaced the headlights in Nicole's car probably three or four different times, just learning how to do it off of YouTube videos. Yeah. How did we do this kind of stuff without YouTube videos? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like m men were a lot manlier, I think, like a, a, a couple, <laughs> a couple of you decades ago. Back when we used to be born knowing how to change headlights. Or just stuff that you knew you had, you had to know that. Like, uh, girls took home ec in high school, and guys got dragged to, like, auto shop. And, like, all right, listen, even if you don't care about cars, you're going to learn how to tear down this 64 Chevy and put it right so. back together piece by piece. I mean, that knowledge isn't necessarily transferable. They weren't all the same. You still just have to have the, like, trial and error nonsense where you just do it wrong a couple of times. <laughs> well, uh, flash forward to today. We have a reverse osmosis system that's in the house. It's just built into the plumbing Water of the house, purification. Right? Yeah, like that. It just it, it you, you have a separate sink or a separate faucet over by the sink that puts out you know pure filtered water versus the tap water, and it's okay. also the feed water for our ice maker, right? And it's just like got three big cartridges on it and like a couple of big cartridges on top. And the entire time that I've lived in this house, I've never even looked twice at it. Like I just it's a thing that's built into the walls. Like I don't even care. Like it works. I'm fine with it. But it stopped working this week. Like it started like the fa the pressure started getting lower now, and lower. Now you got to get smart on it. And yeah, and now it's like, oh, uh, well, now this is my problem. And then <laughs> not only did I learn what every piece of that reverse osmosis filter does and how it works, I also discovered that the last owner of this house put it together wrong and that I have been drinking unfiltered water for the last I don't even know how many years I've lived here. And so I yeah. had to I had to completely tear it down component by component and put it back together the proper way because the guy had screwed it up so bad. And now I'll tell you what, I know everything about that freaking reverse osmosis system. <laughs> and it was all thanks to like, I watched a couple of YouTube videos. I was able to download the manual. I was able to download a flow diagram from a different competing manufacturer for the same type of product. Like I had access to all of it at nice. my fingertips. Okay. So I had it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a less manly version of the story you just told. So <laughs> because we have so many drivers at my house, we have three cars. And our third car is one we kind of inherited from the family. I paid I paid whoever I got it for for it. But I, it was, it's a 1999 Dodge Grand Caravan, but it only has like 140,000 miles on it. Okay. So it's, you know, it's 20 years old and it has all the hallmarks of a 20-year-old car, but it's in good condition. 
Like it, it runs well. The air conditioning works. The, you know, the car. There's no stains in the interior. It's it's fine. When you're a kid, if it gets you from A to B, that's all you care about. Right. It, it's more than good enough for a for a teenager car. And, and you know, in a pinch, they can haul a soccer team. So the. The thing is, my daughter comes home and she's like, uh, Dad, the, the window in the car broke. She didn't say, I broke the window in the car. The window in the car broke. I'm like, like the glass broke? She's like, no, I rolled it down and then it made a kathunk sound and now it won't go back up. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, because there was like rain in the forecast and stuff. I'm like, okay, I got to deal with this right now because this car doesn't go in the garage. So I go out and look at it. And sure enough, like it's making motor noises, but it's jumped the rail or whatever. So I did like you said. I went on YouTube. I watched a couple of videos. I found one of like the exact same model year. So it's not like guesswork where like I can see this. And I start watching watching the video and I watch them take a screw and then start popping those um like um little plastic things that, oh, that hold yeah. body mm -hmm. work on and I'm already starting to check out my brain I'm thinking I don't like those things I always break them and I can never get them back on right yeah and then they get the door open and they're like okay now you kind of got to make it so that the handle fits through and oh you got to unhook this thing over here and they start unhooking like four different things they finally get the front of the door locked and they're like now you got to peel off the the weather uh plastic <laughs> and it's like ripping as they're doing it and then they're like oh and now this thing over here is hooked up and, and they finally get the door apart and they're like now you got to reach in through here and you need this tool and this other tool i'm thinking i don't have that tool i don't have that tool i want to break that thing and I'm, and, and I'm just like there just like you talk about pushing the buttons in your brain when i look at this kind of thing i'm making an assessment if i want to do this task or if i'm willing to outsource it to someone who's done it before and has the right tools right and it just exceeded my threshold like I was like, no, I'm I'm giving it to a mechanic. I estimated in my brain it was probably going to cost me five hundred dollars. Ooh, those... it cost five hundred dollars. Oh, that's good. But it was everything like you said that was wrong with your sink. I took it to the mechanic. They promised to do it. They gave me an estimate, and then they called me back later and they're like, "Did you know the motor was in backwards?" I was like, "Nope." <laughs> like, did you know the door handle thing was also broken? I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> and I'm thinking, glad that's not my problem. Glad that's not my, you know, like if I'd started doing this and found all these things wrong, I'd just be up to my elbows in it, have it all taken apart all over the place, not have anywhere to put it. And here comes the rain. So <laughs> I was really glad I paid a mechanic $500 to do that one for me. So that happened the last time I replaced Nicole's headlights. So the fact that I've had to replace her headlights so many times is played a factor in like, I'm sick of doing it because it's kind of a pain to do. So I bought like super hardcore LED lights that are supposed to last, you know, forever. But they're not like just plug and play. Like it replaces like a part of the socket with like a big transformer thing that you have to go with it. So they're not standard. They're not just going to fit right in. So I had to like kind of jerry rig it in there. And then I broke one of the brackets inside the headlight to hold one of them in place. So I was out there in the early afternoon thinking, I've got all the time in the world. This is not a problem. Flash forward five hours later where the sun is gone. It's pitch black. I've got a work light underneath the car and I'm trying to get my, I'm trying to bend wire in just the right way that I can loop it on this screw that I've threaded into the housing to try to hold the light into place. Oh, yeah. Oh man. I like things to be as close to OEM as I can get them. So when I start ending up in those kinds of situations, I get really antsy. Like I, I hate when, when it's all put back together, it's working again, but it's never going to be the same. Ooh, I can't take that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the next time I have to open that thing to replace the headlight, like I, I don't know if I can, but the, now I've broken it. So if I took it to the dealer, they're going to be like, were you aware that the inside of this thing is completely mm -hmm. like screwed up? Like yeah, I, had, I had no idea. I had no idea. Why would it be this way? <laughs> Oh, that happened to me before. Oh, I'm, I'm, I had a car in college. That's why we get overcharged for labor. Uh, uh, I had a car in college that the, the tube going to the radiator broke and like sprayed water and like this huge steam cloud happened while I was driving. It was crazy. But I opened the hood and I saw it like, oh, it's just this tube is broken. So I went to Home Depot and I got a quick I, – I knew some basic plumbing at the time. So I got some – a couple of push like uh, you know just friction connections and some – uh, hose clamps and put them on there like and it worked for years then when the radiator cracked and i had to take it to uh, uh you know an actual shop years later and the guy was like who repaired this last time because this this is like plumbing you'd find in like a house or an rv and i'm like that's ridiculous i have no idea how that ever got in there <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well I'm, I'm i'm assuming radios are a lot more important where you're from it's been ridiculously hot there lately ah uh, they Actually, this is interesting because remember I made a joke a couple episodes back where I feel like I have to put my family's life in danger in order to have legitimate bad at parenting stories to tell you? Yeah. Well, so no no fault of my own, 
my family's life was in danger and I had absolutely no idea until we made it through the whole scenario. <laughs> what? It's a long story. I don't I don't know if I want to start it here, but we were we went on a, a fishing trip for one day just to try to break the quarantine routine. Uh, we went, drove up north a couple hours to a lake. We went fishing all day, and it was a blast. And we had just such the best time ever. And then we were driving home in Nicole's car. And this is summer in Arizona, so it was 118 degrees outside. And we had the air conditioning on as high as it would go. And we're driving up and down hills, so the car is just like, we're putting the car through its paces, right? And about 20 minutes into the trip, it's a two-hour trip, the air conditioning starts blowing hot. And, oh, no. And we just don't know why. And so we just kind of had to put up with it. And I just thought to myself, well, the car is struggling. It's got a lot of excess engine heat. This is just where it's going to go. Or maybe the air conditioning was going out. I had no idea what was happening at the time, right? So we drove the whole two hours home. And then we're at the one stoplight off of the freeway before we pull into our driveway. And then the overheat light starts flashing. Mm. And uh, we got home safe and fine. But the radiator cap had like the seal on it had broken and we had just been leaking like vapor yeah it just leaking coolant the entire way home and the car was like just on like the the cliff edge of overheating and stranding us in the middle of nowhere in the middle of yeah. summer in arizona do you carry water yeah we had some water but not enough to like fill the radiator and it would have lasted yeah. at all anyway it was like 500 degrees in there like yeah. the next day i tried to drive it uh, two miles to the shop and it overheated halfway there. I had to stop and pull over for half an hour. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so more, more car stuff, right? Yeah. All right. So is there, uh, we've talked about this whole thing to death. Let's do some more classic bad at magic and let's do bad at English. And I have All to right. turn this one over to you because if I tried to do a bad at English segment, it would inevitably be, Way too insulting to our, our British friends. All right. So I've talked sometimes about words that they use that are so ubiquitous that when I started to use them and I came back to the States, I couldn't even remember what word I used to use in its place. And this is one of those words. The word is daft. You've probably heard it before. Maybe in the name of the band from uh, France, the you know, those DJs, Daft Punk. Yep. But the, the word daft in most common usage just means silly or foolish. Uh, but it's so, it feels like it doesn't mean the same thing when British people use it. That Like if uh, something crazy kind of happens, they might go, well, that was a bit daft. Or, well, well, that was a daft thing to say. And it doesn't feel like they're saying the same thing you would be saying if you said that was silly or that was foolish. Well, and the, so here's the thing, like just you saying it right now, if you call something silly, you sound like a kid. Oh, well, that was silly. Like, no one's going to take you seriously. You say, oh, that was foolish. You sound way too highbrow. Like, yeah. oh, who, thanks, Oxford English Dictionary. Nobody cares about your opinion. Like, I feel like daft fits nicely in the middle of that. Like, a, it feels yeah. like a, an easy, common way to say something is silly or foolish without sounding silly or foolish. So that's our bad English word of the day. Daft. daft. That's just daft. I like it. On to our last segment, which I don't I don't know how this, this evolved, but we usually do a bunch of random nonsense at the beginning of the podcast, and then we have like a clean transition into what ends up being a longer topic. Yeah. Uh, we've never asked for feedback on that. My feedback is it works great for me. How does it work out no, for you? It, it, it's just the format of the show now. <laughs> I, I know how it happened. I, I remember how it happened. At some point, uh, we were – we we kind of acknowledge that the fact that our show was it mostly intended to kind of be generally acceptable to any listeners, but some of our topics tend to be a bit niche. Uh, I think there was some stress with some of our listeners with our book reviews who didn't want to read the books and weren't really interested in doing it. So we moved those to the end of the show to give them an, an escape hatch. Got it. And be like, okay, if you made it this far in the show, but you don't want to stick around for the book review, now's the time to get out. Okay. So when I, Originally put this in the notes. My thought was it was going to be one of the short things that we did at the beginning. But then I kept typing and I kept typing. And then we had a text message conversation. And then I typed some more. And I realized this is going to have to be the second half. So okay, we're going to talk about something very specific. Um, I was – my wife and I recently just binge watched the entire show um, Community. It was an NBC sitcom that ran for six years. It had six seasons. And if you've never seen it – Honestly, like at the beginning, I thought I was like, ah, it's another NBC sitcom. But by the end, I, I really enjoyed it. Like they did some things and they took some some risks in their formatting 
that I think make it worth watching. Some, I mean, mm. it's hit or miss like any other NBC sitcom is going to be, but they were willing to step outside the norm and do some different things that I really appreciated as a viewer. One okay. Of the, and one of the things that they did uh, resonated with me uh, for what's going on in the world, and I sent you a homework assignment. Like, I, I sent you my Hulu login, which is against the end user yeah. license agreement. People don't do that. So after you sent me your Hulu login, I found out that it's also on Netflix. And don't ask me how that works, like how multiple streaming <laughs> services services are offering the same whatever. They're just both paying NBC for it. So did you watch it on Netflix or did you watch it on Hulu? Uh, I watched it on Hulu because I hadn't checked yet. But then I went on Netflix. I'm like, oh, it's on here too. I wish I'd known that and told Josh before he sent me his login. No, we broke the license agreement. We didn't have to. Anyway, uh, dang it. So, but the episode I'm talking about is in season three and it's episode four and it's called The Darkest Time. Or no, it's not called that. Um, what is it called? It's like- uh, I can't remember. Uh, remedial Quantum Mechanics or something. It's some weird- Yeah, movie yeah, episode. yeah. But the idea is that it, it creates this idea of um, alternate timelines. And there is a character in the show who is kind of, uh, kind of, uh, he's got to, not necessarily like hardcore developmental issues, but it's like almost like an Asperger's type, very high functioning person, but he's very eccentric. Remedial chaos theory. Remedial chaos theory. There you go. So the idea is that the group, it doesn't matter who the cast is. The cast shows up. There's seven of them. They go to somebody's apartment for a party. There's like this setup that kind of introduces what's going on. And then the doorbell rings and it's the pizza guy. And somebody has to go down and get the pizza. And then so the leader, the nominal like star of the show and the leader of the group says, okay, I'm going to roll this dice, starting person on my left, go all the way around. Whatever number comes up, that's the person goes and gets the pizza. And then our Asperger's guy kicks in and is like, now I hope you realize you're creating six alternate timelines right now. And he goes, and the guy like playing down to him, of course I am. And they do this cool graphic where as he throws the dice, the dice comes out of the center of this image and goes off to one of six different portals with the different results on them and then it shows that result on the dice and that person going to get the pizza and the whole episode is just this three minute scene of what happens if this person gets the pizza instead of this person right that graphic was brilliant because in one instant without any exposition whatsoever you knew exactly what was going to happen the rest of the episode right. like instantaneously you knew okay we're gonna we're gonna watch all six of these possible outcomes how many, how far into those six outcomes did you go, wait a minute, there were seven people? <laughs> that was, uh, it was probably number two or number three when I thought, wait a minute, Jeff's never going to pick himself because there's seven people and there's only six sizes of a dice. And that, yeah, and yeah it, I did the same thing. Yeah, and that ended up being like the last thing that happened is that it goes straight up into the graphic and comes straight back down. And then the guy, the Asperger's guy, catches it and gives this great spiel about how we shouldn't create alternate timelines and that you, sir, are a dirty trickster because you're never going to get the pizza. And then he ended up going to get the pizza. Yeah. And that was the best timeline. <laughs> well, and this, is, this is the thing. Like each one of those iterations of the show, something happened. Like in some different scenario played out and they were interesting to see. And it was funny because like in scenario two, you would learn a couple little snippets that would pay off in scenario five. And so like yeah. – and then the buildup was to – um, yeah, not the, the when he rolled the one, which what ended was up being the song they were trying to sing. I, I really felt the tension of that one. Roxanne, Roxanne, yeah. Every time Roxanne would come on the radio, someone would start to sing it, and in the it would tell me the character's name again. Jeff, Jeff would stop them from singing. Yeah, he just looked like, at her. Oh, yeah. No, I want them to sing Roxanne. Yeah, every knew, time. Okay, at some one point in one of these timelines, they're actually going to go through with it and sing it. <laughs> anyway, one of the timelines happened. It was a big payoff because all of these little pieces of information that you got from the other timelines all fit into this payoff joke in this one where somebody trips over this ball that was hanging out and then a purse fell and then a gunshot went yeah, off and somebody oh, got shot it. i loved it and then yeah it i was, loved that there was a timeline where somebody gets shot the place is on fire you know and he's like i just wanted to get the pizza what's well, going on yeah that was the whole joke is the guy even says like i'm gonna do it super fast so i don't miss anything and he leaves and he comes back to somebody bleeding out on the floor somebody trying to put a fire out and was like somebody else is unconscious like it was this 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 enormous scenario played out in like the two seconds that he was gone yeah. But then, like, if you wait for the post credit scene, like, they go through the whole episode, and it's funny. In the post credit scenes, they go back to that timeline, and they explain, like, one of the characters died. Another character is now in, Lost like, an arm. Yeah, lost an arm to the fire. One of them is now uh, an alcoholic dealing with depression. Another one is locked up in the insane asylum because of the guilt. And, like, the guy, the Asperger's guy says, like, I think we just need to accept that this is the darkest timeline. And we need to embrace it. And we all need to become evil. Like he put on, <laughs> he put on like a little felt goatee, like from that Star Trek episode, and like dedicated himself to being evil. 
And yeah. this created a running gag in the show, and a couple of, like, they bring it up at least once or twice every season, where there is this alternate timeline that exists in the universe that is canon, and the darkest timeline characters are trying to get back to the prime timeline and take over their, mm. their rightful place in the good world. Nice. And it's it does pay off in some places, and it's it's a funny running gag, and I really enjoyed it. But this got me thinking, like... Ben, I was sitting at my desk the other day, and I got another. My wife forwarded me another, yet another article about just some of the nonsense that are happening in American politics right now. All of the different protests that are continuously happening that are having no effect because blue brutality has only been getting worse. Um, just uh, the quarantine. That's some people are in lockdown. Some people are protesting yeah. lockdown, calling it a hoax. Like just every this this. The entire yeah. year 2020, it's becoming a the, meme. The, the consensus that the 2020 is almost just a self-parody of a bad year. Yeah, it's just every – it just keeps snowballing yeah, and worse then, worse. Then, then uh, you know, King T'Challa dies. Like what the heck? You, yeah, Black Panther. Come on. Can't we get through September at least without some tragedy? Ugh. But, but this got me – like I don't know what happened, but it clicked in my brain. I looked up and I went, this is the darkest timeline. Like – we are in the darkest version of what so could have happened. So should we just embrace it and get folk goatees and, and just be evil? Evil Josh and evil Ben. Like that. All right. <laughs> A serious side note. We need to make an evil podcast and put that on for the Patreon subscribers because that sounds well, cool. I was I also was thinking about the darkest timeline, not only because you you were trying to get me involved with this, which I enjoyed, by the way, uh, but also I sent you a, a D and D alignment chart that I'd made of behavior on Zoom calls. Did <laughs> yes, you get, did you get that? I did see that one. That was okay. I don't know if you, what your experience is like because you kind of have a small office, but I have lots of you know big group calls, and and there's just all the chaotic behavior that's happening that contributes to them rarely being what I would consider to be just what should be a routine, well executed group call yes there is um some threshold of number of people in a conference call that make it unwieldy because because like you said we're in a very small office there's only four of us so since there's only four if one person is having a problem or a dog starts barking like it stops everything you know stops who it is. and we know yeah. who it is and we address it like oh hey we can't hear you you're still on mute or whatever but if there's a point there's so many people where if somebody screws up or these things start happening like well i'm not going to interrupt this whole giant call to help fix this guy. And we're just going to let this play out. Yeah. And a lot of the ones we do in the military, a lot of the participants tend to be exclusively audio. And when you don't have the benefit of kind of an identity associated with an interruption, there's this additional layer of chaos that happens because who knows who forgot to meet their phone and is causing the audio feedback or who knows whose dog that is barking. And I've gotten to the point where I recognize one guy, one of our engineers who always forgets to meet his phone has a very clicky mechanical keyboard. We're like, Doug, Doug, you forgot to meet your phone. You're answering emails. You clicky keyboard. Come on, Doug. Uh, all right, so there are some things like that. That's the number one rule. People, if you're teleworking and you are not actively speaking, mute your microphone. I don't care if you're Holy audio cow, only. Yes. I don't care oh if you're God. video. Like, I feel like that that should be a joke in itself. Like, there should be a bunch of people on a Zoom call, and then somebody doesn't mute their microphone, and their dog is going, or a kid's running in the background. Like, I want to see somebody in the Zoom call in one other window stand up, walk off frame, and walk on frame onto that person, <laughs> and then just strangle them. Oh, my gosh. Brentel Floss did a classic video of that where he's arguing with a guy in England about whether or not um, Ocarina of Time is the greatest video game of all time. And he walks out <laughs> his door and then walks into the other guy's apartment in England. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's great. That sounds great. But no, that, yeah, mute your microphones. Yes. So Okay, so we're on the darkest timeline. Is that what you're saying? So what I'm saying is this is what started the conversation. And I thought it was really funny because I was – this observation was so profound to me that I, I asked you, do you watch Community? You said no. I said, okay, here is my Hulu login. You go watch this 30-minute NBC sitcom from six years ago because I have one joke that I'm going to make, and it's super yeah, important. And it's only 21 minutes uh, well, they... without commercials. <laughs> but so that's the thing. Like I was so hardcore in this, this, like, this, this profound understanding of this is the darkest timeline. And yes, maybe we should just embrace it. But then you brought up a very interesting aspect of this that I had not even thought about. And you asked two questions. You asked, what was the flashpoint? Like, what was the point that caused us to break into this darkest timeline? And how would the timelines be different? For, for 2020. You said that for 2020, but then like, yes. that, that, that's too hard. 
Nothing that I did, I think, caused 2020. Good Lord, I hope not. Like, knock on wood, man. Like, I hope I didn't cause 2020. Right. So what, so what are the the um, points in our lives that you would have had an alternate timeline? Yes. So that that's – I I mentioned this before too is it, with, with age comes wisdom. And with wisdom, you can look back on your life and you can pick out those forks in the road. Like, when you're at that fork, you don't necessarily recognize it. But looking back, you can tell – like if I had said yes instead of no at that point in time right there, my life would be so radically different. I don't even understand it. Yeah. Have you given that any thought this week? Absolutely, man. That, I, that's one of the reasons I'm so attracted to things like Groundhog Day and Back to the Future and, and those kinds of things. Because there's this idea that like uh, Back to the Future is a great example. You know, we start off in Marty McFly's life and it's kind of crappy. You know, his his brother's working at the fast food place. His sister's grown and still living at home. His his dad's a wimp. His mom's an alcoholic. And, you know, he goes back into the past. The 1955 happens to be their inflection point. He changes really one thing, and then he comes back to the future, and his dad is a successful professional. His mom is attractive and, and wealth and fit. His brother is the same. His sister and his whole life is better because of that, you know, who got punched out at the dance. And yet they live at the same house. <laughs> you got to cut the movie a little bit of slack. <laughs> I mean, no, but, I, yeah, and to, I, I, so I grew up seeing that, you know, that was, um, that was, that was, you know, 1984. That was when I was a kid. And so I grew up watching Back to the Future, uh, even the cartoon about it on TV. And the idea was you could change your present by fixing a, a one little thing in the past. And so that brain, that idea just seeded in my brain and I think about it so much. You know, I'll reach a point in my life where I'm really frustrated with something and I'll think back, what was the time when this started? When was the time that I first started having this problem? And what if I'd done something different then? Where would I be at now? Hmm. So, that yeah, there's a whole – we can have a whole episode about the psychology of temporal mechanics and how, like, looking to looking back and figuring out how we could have changed our past, like, precludes us from maybe solving the problem in the present. But that's neither here nor now. Uh, that is neither here nor there. No, it I like here nor now. Here nor, here <laughs> nor now. <laughs> The conversation that I want to have is the total fantasy nonsense discussion of how our lives would be different and what are those what are those points? What are those forks in the road that we had? You mean like the the one outcome on community where they threw the dice up in the air and there was like a fire and someone got shot kind of thing? Yeah, he threw a dice to see who would get the pizza and that created the darkest timeline where somebody was dead, another person was maimed, and two people had severe mental distress. Okay. Okay, I'm game. All right. So, so I, I can, need you to get me started, though, because I'm not having any immediate ideas. Oh, no problem. I've got a whole list. I've got a whole list of these flashpoints just, like, stored in my head because I, 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 I don't know why, but I just always remember them. Like, you know what? That was one of those points. The first one that I can remember was um, when I was a kid, we lived out way in the suburbs. Like, when I say way in the suburbs, like, we had a two-acre plot with pastures and farm animals. Like, we had goats when I was a kid and rabbits and cows that we slaughtered. And had the so when you use stuff. goats as a metaphor, it's coming from close personal experience. <laughs> My parents, like, so in retrospect, when you, again, you're a kid, you have a limited perspective. Those goats were super fun. They were the funnest animal to play with ever because they would climb on anything. It was so fun. My parents hated them with a passion <laughs> because they were like nature's escape artists. There was nothing they could do to keep those stupid goats contained. And, of course, it's not easy to herd goats. So whenever they got out, it was this huge pain to go track them down. Okay. Anywho. So you live down in the suburbs. Lived way out in the sticks almost. Um, at one point, uh, we had neighbors that my parents were very close friends with that had horses. And they did horse stuff. Like Specifically, they did barrel racing. Like they, they went to like amateur rodeos every other weekend or something and did barrel racing on their horses, you know, for fun. People do that kind of stuff all the time. It, 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 pick a thing. There is a huge rabbit hole and a giant community of people that are devoted to it. And so right. they and they were such close friends with my parents that my my parents got like you know enthused by it like let's give it a shot, and they bought a horse they bought all the tack uh, I remember my dad practicing for a while out in the pasture doing his pretend barrel racing on this horse so both him and the horse could learn how to do it, mm -hmm. and they loaded it up in a horse trailer that we had and we drove off to the very first amateur rodeo that my dad was going to try to compete in, and 
apparently the horse lost its mind. Like it was just in this very loud, crowded, noisy, new place with all these other horses. Right. To you guys, it was doing the same thing you'd always done at your house. And to the horse, this was completely not what it was used to. Oh, yeah. Uh, so like my dad said, like its eyes were rolling and like his nose was bleeding. Like it, it had a full on panic attack. And so he ended up not competing that night. Okay. I look back at that moment and I think to myself, what if that horse hadn't freaked out? What if that horse did its thing and my dad fell in love with barrel racing and like, and then he like became enthused by it. And then obviously you want your loved ones to, to have the same kind of passion and wow, interest that you that's have. That's a good one, Josh. Right. Because we never would have moved into like, we moved into suburbs proper where you just had like the house made a ticky tacky like every other place. And we, we had a great childhood. But we never would have moved away from that those two acre plots. We would have had horses growing up. Maybe I would have been more interested in 4-H than I was in the football team. Who knows? Uh -huh. There are so many trickle down effects that that could have had on my life that I don't. I it's unknowable to foresee how my life would have changed if that horse hadn't freaked out that night. Wow, wow, that's a great one. <laughs> okay, I got one for you. So. Up until the time that I was eight years old, my life was on a very predictable track. My parents had both grown up on farms in southern Idaho. Other than the fact that my dad went to Europe on his uh, mission for the church, they had both never really been outside of, you know, like 100 square miles in southeastern Idaho. And uh, they got married and settled down near both of their parents' farms, and we were on track to just move into uh, – We my parents had just bought their first home together in Idaho Falls, and we were going to live there forever. Like that was going to be our existence. I would have just grown up in southeastern Idaho. But when I was seven, my youngest sister was born with cystic fibrosis. Uh Cystic fibrosis is a recessive genetic disorder. I want to give it a full treatment in, uh, on Bad at Magic and actually do a you know full education on what it is. So we'll do that in the future. But needless to say, it completely threw all of their plans into disarray, and 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 it led to the inexorable series of events that that ha caused my dad to join the Air Force, us to move away, move all over the world, and probably also contribute to the fact that I went into the Air Force. So rewind to that moment, and and. Um, my sister, I absolutely adore her, and she's you know one of the best things in in my my world. Um, but let's say that just through the intricacies of two people's genetics combining, she just didn't get both recessive genes and contract cystic fibrosis and was born a normal, healthy child. Um, my, my whole existence, uh, you and I never would have met. You know, I, I can't even say the the end of the impact of all of the things that this caused to happen in my life. Man, this is – people, we're living in a 2020 that has Ben Rich out in the world. What if we're living in a 2020 where Ben Rich was still in southeastern Idaho? We'd be completely screwed. <laughs> I just – yeah, I don't know. I'd be potato farming right now. <laughs> just sitting on your potato farm like, shucks, it's a shame what's happened in the world. I wish I could have contributed a little bit more to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good yeah. – I've got more. Um the next one, I'm trying to do them on a, on a linear timeline, like as, as I got older. The next okay. one that I can remember clearly was um, I was in college, okay, at the Air Force Academy. It is, I don't even remember when. It's either um, halfway through your senior year or close to the beginning of senior year where you actually get your um, job. Yeah, the, the Air Force comes out and says you're graduating such and such date. This is the career field that you are going to move into. And the way they do that is they assign you an Air Force specialty code, an AFSC. And every job in the Air Force has an AFSC associated with it that determines its career path, the training that you get, what you're going to do with your life. Like it really determines like what you what you are as as far as the Air Force is concerned. And they do it. They really do it up at the academy. Like they take your whole squad around oh, yeah. and you go to a big yeah. group thing. It's like it's like a it's like a um, fantasy football draft or something. They really want to make a big deal out of it. Yeah, exactly. Because everybody there, like your whole everybody, is working towards the same goal of graduating and being officers in the Air Force. And blah, no, this blah, is blah. like this is like the first night at Hogwarts when you put on the sorting hat. Kind of like that. Yeah, honestly, kind of like that. So they bring the whole squadron, not just the people that are going to graduate and get their get their AFSCs. The whole squadron gets in a big group, and they're all dressed up, and you get called up by your commander one at a time. And he opens the sealed envelope, and he says, you are, you know, this AFSC. Everybody cheers. Everybody's happy. Yay. You're going to Hufflepuff yeah. House. Yeah. Here's the thing, Ben, about the academy. 
Everybody that goes to the Academy wants to be a pilot. Hands down, period, dot. Everybody wants to be a pilot. Okay. Which is 92 Tango or something for... But for, everyone can't be a pilot. At, actually, at the Academy, everybody can be a pilot. The Academy I see. Get, The Academy gets the same number of pilot slots that all of ROTC in the entire United States gets. So this is why if you want to be... like. Listeners, if you want to be a pilot in the U.S. Air Force, go to the academy, get like a C average. You'll be a pilot. No problem. I didn't. I am the weirdest guy because like when they said, it's like, oh, you want to be a pilot, right? I'm the one that smiles and said, nope, absolutely no desire. I hate flying. And like it was, I was Why such did you a, go to the academy then? I, I got that question like many, many times. Yeah. Like, and because it's free, apparently is not the answer you're supposed to give to people that are in charge of you. <laughs> So it was my turn. All right. So is and, that what you're saying here? What if you, what if that moment? What if you had been a pilot? No, 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 no. It's different than that because this is what happened. Is I it, like we talked about before? I knew cyber was going to be a thing. I had talked to the the comm officer colonels that were running the computer science department. Like I knew. Like I was career planning already. Like this is the direction that I want to go. How do I make it happen? And the answer was: Do you need to be a comm officer? You need to be 33 Sierra. No problem. 33 Sierra. Applied, put that on my list. Like, this is what I'm going to do. So then come selection night, everybody stands at the front, and they kind of got that smug smile, like, I know what I am already, and they open, they just get confirmed, right? And so I'm standing up there with the same smile, like, yes, and he opens it up. You are going to be, uh, I think it was 62 Echo, developmental engineer. And then, and yeah, and my face fell, and I went, what? And, like, it was, like, seriously, dead silence. Like, you could hear a pin drop because... (laughs) That does not happen. Like people were freaking out. Like holy crap, he got something he didn't wanted. Did like, you get punked? Was no. it Ashton Kutcher reading it off? It was no. It was yeah. It was an actual. I was assigned as a sixty-two. I think it's sixty-two Echo Developmental Engineer, which is the FSC what? my brother actually ended up getting. But I was like okay, and I took it and and just went and sat down. And people were like, "Is that what you wanted?" I'm like, "No, no, this is not what I wanted. I have a whole plan." And um, so I went to my department head at the computer science department, who was a Fulberg colonel at the time, and he was a 33 Sierra. So, you know, Fulberg colonels that are in an AFSC, they know the functional, right? And he and he was the, the AFSC that you wanted to become. Yes. And so I just told him what had happened, and he's like, oh, no, we can get that fixed. And he did the 06, pulled some strings in the background, whatever. Just like I, Harry Potter. Just, yeah, exactly hey, how it works. You, you'd make a great Slytherin. <laughs> no, I'd rather be a Gryffindor. Okay. Oh, uh, you sure. We'll give you what you want. Mr. Lightning okay, Bolt so face. what's the alternate timeline? That if you'd actually gone through with it and been a Slytherin? So I had to go out of my way to pull strings to go into calm, which then led to my normal life. What if I had just taken it? What if I had been a little more passive in my life and just taken the 62 Echo Developmental Engineer? I'd have gotten wow, a different... Completely different life path. Totally different life path. Totally different training. Totally different probably wouldn't have met me. Structure. Probably not met Nicole. Nope. My whole... my and I wouldn't have gone to the same basis. Like, my whole life would be so indescribably different that I have no idea what it even looks like. Now, now I'm wondering about your two things that you've given together. What if you had been horseman, but for some fluke, you'd still decide to go to the Academy and then you still could have ended up down the same path. Some developmental engineer with a cowboy hat. It's like, well, yeah. sir, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just a simple farmhand here, but this is how I build advise you. Yeah. All right. I got one. <laughs> okay. It's a little bit personal, but I, I think it'll work. Okay. So I'm 17 years old. Uh, senior in high school, I'm working at Taco Bell. Uh, they usually it was like me and 100 Mexicans, so they had me work the front so that I could talk to the other people that came in that spoke English as a first language. And racist um, man, Ben, <laughs> just talking the truth here. This is this was my <laughs> life. They called me Pinche Pendejo. Uh, so I was up front, and um, this girl walks in. Um, I could tell she was about my age. Um, she looked a bit punky, like she had shoulder length, blonde hair, real cute. And she, I knew and you she, were into that punk look back then too. Cause uh, well, we all were, I was just, I, I was very busy in my senior year stuff. Like, you know, I was on the <laughs> track team and I had a job and I did seminary before, um, school and I just didn't have time. I wasn't dating anyone or doing anything like that. And she walks in and this has never happened to me like this before or since. Uh, and she took one look at me and she goes, uh, how long you been working here? I'm like, excuse me. She's like, like you work here, right? I'm like, yeah, obviously this is a purple shirt and a hat and (laughs) drive through microphone. Um, and she's like, um, when's your next shift? And 
yeah. And, and I told her and she, she came back the next time. Oh, and hey. I think this, the second time she came back, she was like, what are you doing after work? Or like, what are you doing this weekend? And I was like, okay, I guess she's into me. So let's do this. Now I have to give you a bit of cultural background that you're probably already assuming, but I'm going to make it, I'm going to say it just to make it obvious. That your I life was, makes a leave it to beaver, like after school special seem very wild. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, let, let me, let me read, I'm going to bring it up here and read the actual thing. Listeners, this is another thing that Ben does that I just am never going to be able to do is he is so well researched that he can, at the drop of a hat, pull up an authoritative source and cite it for exactly the kind of point that he wants to make in this next sentence. Okay, so the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints publishes a pamphlet that details the standards for the young people in the church to follow. So I'm going to read you an excerpt from the, from the section entitled Dating. You should not date until you are at least 16 years old. When you begin dating, go with one or more additional couples. Avoid going on frequent dates with the same person. Developing serious relationships too early in life can limit the number of people you meet and perhaps lead to immorality. Okay, so hang on a second. There's a lot of mixed metaphors here because at the one point they're saying something that I disagree with and at the other side they're saying exactly what I agree with. And it's like, you shouldn't date before you're 16. You said that and the first thing that went through my head is like, that's not enough time. Because then the second point they make is you shouldn't date the same person too much, too fast, because you're not going to get an understanding of what an interpersonal relationship is supposed to be. Right. And so anyway. the, the logical conclusion of that pamphlet is that from the year 16 to when you're shipped out as a missionary at age 18, you need to date like all of the girls in that window. Well, group dating and, you know, just – not not getting exclusive and serious, the kind of things that would lead to sexual immorality. That's what they're getting at. <laughs> this is, I want to see the parents' pamphlet, the pamphlet that the parents get that they don't tell the kids about. It. Like, this is how you keep your kids off of that radar. And it's like, you get them a job after school. You have them go to seminary before school. <laughs> you have them join the track team so they're exhausted all the time. Like, that's exactly what would be in that pamphlet. Yeah. Okay, so this girl comes along and just interjects herself into my life. Like, and she's not a member of the church, but she is really into me, like, right off the bat. She comes in, she's like, you, I like you. Let's do something. Um, and and I think... Let's do all what? the things the pamphlets say we shouldn't do. I, 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 <laughs> I go, you know what? Okay, I'm going to give this a shot. Like, uh, up to this point, and also in here, uh, oh, let me skip ahead a little bit in the standard. Choose to date only those who have high moral standards and in whose company you can maintain your standards. Oh, man, so, she's got a pixie cut. She's already questionable. <laughs> I knew immediately I was departing from that particular tenant when I agreed to go out with her. This is outstanding. I, so I just squeezed it in, you know, on a, a Friday, like after my shift got over or on a Saturday when I didn't have a shift or whatever. I was just like, okay, we'll go out to a movie or something like that. I got a little bit of spending cash. And I don't, I don't mind taking out a girl that's into me, even if she's not a member of the church. Let's see where this goes. She was cute. I kind of wanted to see where, what, what it would lead to. Or, but... <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine poor Ben Rich being more so morally torn between the base, terrible secular instincts that a 17-year-old boy would have with a cute girl and then just the, the pure, raw, good person that you are saying, no, Ben, you've got to listen to the pamphlet. All right. Well, it came to head pretty fast. <laughs> so it was maybe it was maybe the third or fourth date. She says, hey, can we just swing by my ha house real quick? I need to get something. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> why do you why do you immediately know what's going to happen next um so we go to her house we go in the living room like i don't know her brother or something sitting there watching tv and she's like hey this is ben i was telling you about like hey you know barely even look up from whatever television you're sharing watching she's like uh come on come on to my room in the basement so you go to the basement there's no one else in the basement she goes in the room she closes the door she's like i just need to change clothes these I've are never been this is I've never been case. in a situation even remotely like this ever before in my life. And I'm thinking, this is the thing they always warned me about in church. Like, how did I get here? How, how did my life come to this point where I made the decisions <laughs> and now here I am in this situation? <laughs> that is – that that's that's awesome. Like, I don't even think you need to – like, so the, the finish of this story is that you very awkwardly removed and, yourself oh, – yeah. I think I think that's a great idea. I'm not going to say what happened, uh, <laughs> but this is one of those inflection points where I could have gone a different way. Okay, 
Uh, you know what? You that story reminded me that I had one just just like that when I was just when I just left for college. And um, since you gave something personal and embarrassing up, I will give up something personal and embarrassing as well. All right. All right. So when I was a senior in high school, there was a girl that I didn't date because her parents wouldn't let her date. Uh, she was Filipino and her parents were very like like had emigrated. So they were very traditional, very old school, hardcore. Like, You're going to be a doctor. You don't have time for boys kind of thing. <laughs> like the Asian dad meme. Yeah, basically. Well, this is the impression that I got because I never met them, obviously. This is just what she told me. It could have been a ruse. Uh -huh. Maybe she was just playing me on the side. I don't know. But so there was Your a – like, going to kill me. Like, well, when we were seniors in high school together, right, we, we – like, she was cute, obviously. And, I mean, I'm me, so come on. But we had the, <laughs> these handful of uh, near misses, right, just, just through senior year. Just one of those things that happens. But I was back from the academy – uh, on leave one day when I was a freshman. So we like, and all of my friends had gone off to like state colleges. Right. And I got invited by a bunch of my friends went to U of A because if you were one of the smart kids and there's three state universities in Arizona, if you're one of the smart kids, at least in my school, you went to U of A. And so I got an invitation, drive down to Tucson to see everybody and hang out and just do the thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. Like what? Like I just drive down there and drive back. That doesn't seem like, Oh no, no, we'll, we'll put you up in one of the dorms with somebody. It'll be fine. Like, Oh, okay. That sounds fun. So I drove down to Tucson and just spent the day bouncing between, like, they had classes and things. It was like a Friday or something. But um, they had worked out a schedule where, oh, this person doesn't have classes, so you go hang out with them. And then when they go to class, you go hang out with these people. Like, it was we, – we were, we were nerds, Ben, so we were very organized about this. <laughs> but then this – we got towards the end of the day. I'm like, okay, so uh, what's this, the, the arrangement here? And it was the girl had said, like, oh, well, you're just going to stay with me. In your dorm, just just us. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. And I remember going to her dorm, and we were both like, we're both like, you know, kids, like very awkwardly about it. So, and she's like, "Well, I got to get some homework done." I'm like, oh, okay. So she goes on her computer and starts doing her homework, and I just kind of sat and started reading a book, like in her dorm room. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, what am I like? And I'm like trying to be cool about it, but at the same time, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do in this situation. Like, at all. Hands down. Period. Like, I just don't even know. And the night just progresses, and neither one of us made any moves like like that. And just super awkward. And then she's uh, like, okay, well, is this your roommate's bed? Do you just want me to sleep on the floor? She's like, oh, no, you can sleep in the bed with me. I'm like, okay. And then we, like, <laughs> climb into her bed, and we're awkwardly, like, spooning. And we just went to sleep. And then woke up the next day, and I left. <laughs> and yeah. this is the thing. Like, she was... After that, like the the sheer awkwardness between us, like prevented me from prevented us from ever speaking to each other again, and it was just because neither one of us we were both too nerdy or didn't know how to make the advance the relationship at that point, right? I like that story; it's sweet. <laughs> it just shows I'm such a I was a nerd loser back in the day. My wife can collaborate. I was a nerd loser right up to the day she met me. All right, but what do you imagine nerd loser Ben did when when cute blonde uh, <laughs> you know punk girl brings him in her bedroom and starts undressing? So there's always a range of things that could have happened. What I imagine happened is you were very polite. You very politely averted your eyes and turned your back and like let her do her thing. And then you guys left, had an awkward date, and you just didn't follow up with her ever again. That's what I th is more realistic would have happened. Um, but what I like to think would have happened is you pulled the pamphlet and like sat her down and explained all of the error <laughs> of her ways. Like, listen, you're a sweet girl, but you are going about this all wrong. I was already off the reservation when I decided to go on the first date with her. <laughs> By the time we got to her bedroom and she was undressing, I was way past that. Your description of what happened was so close. I don't even need to correct any details. <laughs> politely averted my gaze, quickly got out of there, and and stopped dating shortly after that. Ah, ben, you see, and this is this is the problem, though. This is the problem. I I I am willing to put money down on the line. Like Alicia's a wonderful person. Obviously, everything worked out exactly the way that it should have. But there's still a little part of you that thinks back to that day and just wants to go. You know, there would have been no harm in just turning around for just a quick little peek. You know. I think about the day that I was sitting in the dorm room with, with the girl, the cute girl that I liked, and I didn't do anything. Like, if if 37-year-old Josh could go back and, like, you know, nudge 17-year-old Josh, like, hey, go ahead. Like, that was... All right, so 
that could have been a flashpoint so, if I ended up in a serious committed relationship with some person that I, you know, who who knows what would have happened then, what decisions so, I would have made. Yes, good. What else is on your alternate timeline? Oh, I got to go two, two in a row. Okay, so one of these was very interesting. Um, we talked in another in a previous episode about my whole big Air Force life and how yeah, I'm, last episode what was that last episode? It felt like so long, Ben. <laughs> Like, I got accepted to go to the drone program, right? Well, at that point, I don't know if I mentioned this, but a week after I got that acceptance letter, my commander told me, hey, by the way, you just got orders from the comm guys. Like, you you got your orders to PCS and go to a new job from the comm career field that you're currently in. And it was to Germany. And not just like, there, there's a big base in Germany that's just like every other base on, on in the U.S., Wow, but what this, an enticing alternate timeline. This would have been one of the small bases in Germany where I, I wouldn't have worked for anybody. Like, I would have been the calm guy, kind of like what you did in Italy. Yeah, where, yeah. It was probably the exact same thing I did in Italy. There's a, Something like, yeah, so in a similar situation, different mission. Who knows what it was because I didn't end up going. But how different would my life have been if I had stayed in calm, gotten into a career field, maybe with a, with a, somebody that I respected, and like just loved life being in Germany, never would have met Nicole, probably would have learned the local language, probably would have married some blonde, uh, some blonde, blue eyed, you know, German, German girl, German uh, heart surgeon, whatever they say that all the East Europeans are. Yeah. But yeah, the totally, totally radically different life. Yeah. Wow. That's an interesting alternate timeline. I wouldn't have gone to Clovis. I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have bought that house in New Mexico that to this day haunts my existence. <laughs> Listener, yeah. we, we can have a whole episode about how buying a house in New Mexico in 2010 has haunted me for a decade. All right, so I want to match that one. So when I um when I wanted to go into the Air Force, I had to fight. Unlike you, I didn't just, you know, get into the academy and come in out at the top of the heap. I went in through the lowest status accession source there is. Uh, civilian off the street who already has their college degree going to officer training school. This is this is sometimes they don't even take people this way. This is the only, if they've already gotten they've haven't met their quotas through the academy and through ROTC and through enlisted guys crossing over. Maybe they'll let a few scrubs off the street come in the back door. That's what this is. So, but at the time they were absolutely not under any circumstances taking comm officers. They would not. They were full up. They had more than they needed, but that's what I wanted to do. So I had that moment where they're like, so, uh, well, we don't really look like we need anybody, but what did you want to do? Uh, I says, well, I want to be a comm officer. I said, well, we're not taking comm officers. We're only taking air battle managers. I said, oh, did I say comm officer? I meant air battle manager. <laughs> and they're like, fine. And they sent me to Idaho for a flight physical because you fly in the backseat of an AWACS or a J stars and you stare at a screen and, and, you know, get on a radio and tell guys on the ground or pilots. To be fair, on. air battle managers are hardcore because like you said, they sit in the back of what is essentially a commercial airliner. They stare at a round screen. That is a radar blip that you see in all the movies where it's like green lines sweeping around and they get little dots that pop up and they're telling those dots where to go. So they don't run into each other. And oh, by the way, since you're on a plane, your point of origin is constantly going in a circle. So everything on your screen is slowly rotating 360 degrees every few yeah. minutes. So those guys have a really hard job. So I don't know how this happens because I'm a civilian off the street, but they um, sent me for my flight physical and they, they do, like you said, there's very stringent physical requirements. You have to, you know, be a certain level of fitness and you have to have a certain level of vision and strength and all those kinds of things. And if you don't meet all this stuff, then you don't meet their minimum qualifications. Well, speaking of alternate timelines, when I was three years old, I was playing with an umbrella and I stabbed myself in the eye with it. I opened it in the house and you know what they say about that. Uh, <laughs> you get stabbed I had in to the wear, face? <laughs> yeah, I stabbed myself in the eye with an umbrella. And I had to wear a patch over my eye for, I don't know, like six weeks or something. When I took it off, I was all, I always had blurry vision in that line. But my vision, my other eye was so good, I never needed glasses. And I didn't know until, I, you know, I started getting older and I went to things like flight physicals. And the doctor looks at me and goes, oh, ooh. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? And they're like, well, you have a scar on your cornea. I'm like, yeah, I know. My vision's kind of blurry in my left eye. They're like, does this look better? No. Does this look better? No. They're like, uh, your vision's not correctable by lenses. 
<laughs> you got uh, that big. I don't. You got that big Captain America four F stamp on your. File. Oh, you nailed it. That's exactly what happened. Boom, four F stamp on my file. I didn't know that. <laughs> so that goes back to my recruiter, and it, it kind of stalled out my my process. Meanwhile, I'm teaching school in, in uh, Las Vegas, um, and the, the the recruiter goes really cold. And I, I kind of call him up, and I'm I'm being really persistent. I'm like, well, what can be done about that? He's like, well, we can see if we can get you a waiver. I don't know what that means. One day he calls me up and he says, all right, your waiver was approved. Here's your date for officer training school. I'm like, great. So I go to officer training school, go through my 12 weeks of basic training, get out and report to the um, to Tyndall Air Force Base for air battle manager training. Did you know I did that? I actually went to Tyndall Air Force Base. For I think, yeah, I think you've training. told me the story. So I show up at the base. Um, they just do the regular in processing and they review my medical records and they say and they go, oh, you never should have been let into the Air Force. I'm like, <laughs> this isn't waverable. How did you even get here? Right. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, no, you've told me this story because um, you told it was it's such a great thing because you slipped through so many bureaucratic cracks that they didn't know what to do with you for a long time. Right. Right. So finally, they, you know, finally they're like, uh, well, you can't stay here. I'm like, well, can I be a comm officer? They're like, I don't know. I'll call somebody. And and whatever phone call they made, it worked. And I got into the un-get into a AFSC. Oh, well, let me tell you what that phone call was like. They called the, the, the freaking functional at uh, Texas down there. And they say, hey, what are the requirements to be a comm officer? Well, does your guy have a pulse? Yes, he does. He can be a comm officer. <laughs> yeah so i snuck in the back door but my alternate timeline is somebody somewhere had to have signed a piece of paper that said i had a waiver i don't know how i would have been sent to training without it so let's say they find that and i'm an air battle manager instead you know now i'm i'm a flyer you know i'm wearing a flight suit i'm flying back to an aircraft i'm in operational squadrons i'm deploying all the time just completely different life and existence you wouldn't have made it as a any kind of flying type of guy. You just don't have the the presence to be one of the Air Force pilots because that's something they drill into them. Like you have to have this level of cockiness or you're just not going to make the cut. <laughs> well, okay, even though I, I didn't go there, I was in the schoolhouse for seven months on casual status. And I had to go to all of their meetings and stuff, and they were they were giving each other call signs, and they had the you know all the oh, rituals and I, nonsense I, they were going through. For all of our civilian listeners, like pilots act like it's a fraternity. Like honestly, they act like yes. frat guys. Like just yeah, they had a bar out. in the training squadron, and yeah. I was when I was a lieutenant, um, the base commander who was a pilot, of course. Um, he had a bunch of Air Force Academy and ROTC cadets that were there just like on a summer program to see what the real Air Force is like. And he had them all over to his house for a big barbecue one night. And he invited a bunch of like new second lieutenants. Like he told his commanders like, hey, I need new second lieutenants to come in and talk about their transition from ROTC or the Air Force Academy to the real Air Force to all of these cadets just to, you know, something they can relate to. And I remember being at this, I was, I was tasked to go to this guy's barbecue this, this wing commander general pilot. And I was talking to a handful of academy cadets, just like what it's like, you know, like getting out of the academy and going to rear air force, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the one star base commander walks over to our little, our little group. And of course everybody shuts up because he's a, he's a general and I'm trying to right. keep the things going. I'm like, Oh, sir, he, this is cadet he was standing behind you. Whoever. Oh, okay. You knew he was there. I knew he was there. You know, I introduced him to the cadets and like it, the conversation like immediately stalls. And he's just like, he's ever like, he's standing there with his beard, just like nodding his head. Like, okay, what's going to happen next? I'm like, Oh, well, sir, can you, uh, is there any like cool fighter pilot stories you can tell us? And like, he like takes a swig of his beer and pulls it down from his face. He looks at me and he goes, F you, Fleshman. I'm not going to tell you any cool fighter pilot stories. Takes another swig and then walks off. And Whoa. Yeah. And like that right there. And I, I looked at him as he's walking away and I'm like, and that's what fighter pilots are like. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> yeah. that That's your, your base commander, ladies and gentlemen. Was that Burton <laughs> Field? No, that was uh... – was it feel? I don't. I don't even know the guy's name. He was a jerk. Okay, because anyway. I had I ha I had an experience similar to where everyone around shut up and I was the one talking to him and and it ended with him telling me to go screw myself. Also, yeah, so, but but to, to be fair, Ben, you've told more than one story where that was the punchline. And like, and then I was the last guy talking, and then the commander told me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something we have in common somehow. I don't know how. Well, All right, but, you got any more? Um, I mean, yes, I actually I have one more. I, I do have one more. So there I was, 
brand new civilian. Like, took off my flight suit, gave the, the finger to the Air Force, and just couldn't be happier about it. Uh, I start my own company as a pool guy, and I'm doing pretty good. And I'm about maybe a year into it. And I get a call from a buddy of mine. Um, he calls me, hey, my company's looking for pilots, for drone pilots. Are you still interested? And I kind of hit him home, like, well, I mean, I'm not going to say no to an opportunity. Like, like, go ahead and give my name to the guy. And then the guy called me. He's like, hey, we heard that you were... Like all this stuff. And we, I mean, I had multiple long conversations with the guy about at the time they were looking for somebody that could potentially lead a program. Like it, it was, they were looking for like more of a managerial type of person to make this, this new thing that they were standing up. And I was on one of their, on their short list based on recommendations from a bunch of different people that I had met in my life as a drone. Like a, a funny story. I was, I was a flight commander three or four times. I kept getting fired. But the people that I was in charge of very much respected me because I knew what I was doing and I knew what I was talking about. And three or four of them eventually got out of the Air Force and joined a civilian company. And then when my name and came they wanted you. And when the name yeah. when my name came up, they're like, Oh no, that's the guy. That's the guy you want. And that's why this guy called me. Okay. And so I was I'm like, Yeah, if you're gonna stand up this program, I'm I'm on board. And you know, a few weeks go by and he calls me, he's like, Hey, the way, just the way the world works, I guess, like that whole thing fell through. He's like, but we are looking for pilots. Are you interested in coming back as, as a pilot, uh, on this, doing the civilian as contract. a contractor, as a contractor. So what would that mean? I, I assume that would mean you're getting paid like three times as much as you were in the military. It means three months downrange deployed to a foreign country, flying the plane and then three months at home doing basically nothing. And it's three months on three months off and you make six digits. Yeah. It's, it's a very lucrative thing to do yeah and at time like i just i just didn't want to do it like i, I yeah I, I i i i don't know there's a lot of justifications like it's tough being gone that much when you have little kids yeah, um, yeah. i i just gotten out of the military and i i had very very bad experiences as a drone pilot so that was kind of tainting my my perspective on the whole thing but so that's every once in a while so i think back. what like, if you had what if i just said yes and like yeah. there was another one of the things at the time I you had to have a commercial pilot's license. So I they would have um they told me like, Oh, we'll compensate you have to go get the pilot's license, but then we'll pay you at the other side. So then like I would have I don't know, there was this whole process where I would have had to fly planes and, and go through like six months of constant air sickness again to try to get mm. more certifications and things. Like I don't know. But it, that's another one of those things that like, my life today would be radically different if I had said yes instead of no on a phone call. All right, I got one more. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go dark on this one. Good because this is the darkest timeline. Okay, so in 2005, uh, I had been in the first comm squadron because of the way I came in. I came in like out of cycle with the rest. Like there was a ton of young officers in that squadron at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, um, but the they. I came in out of cycle because of the way I came in because, you know, like the thing with the air battle manager school and stuff like that. So I didn't come in with a bunch of other guys. So the hazing that happened in that squadron was kind of light. It was that the squadron played lots of intramural sporting events and they had built this uh, PA portable PA system that you use to like rile up the crowd at the, at these events. Boomer. And they initiate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Boomer. Boomer. They initiated the low, the lowest, the lowest ranking lieutenant in the squadron by assigning him custody and maintenance of Boomer. So you had to show up to the squadron sporting events, bring this thing with you and operate it at the event to rile up the crowd to cheer for your squadron in the intramural sporting events. I had Boomer in the trunk of my car for three months. So here's what, well, you forget Boomer is why you and I met. I do so, forget that. Yes, you're right. I, I got there and then you arrived, I don't know, six months later, some something in that kind of timeline. And I was excited that you had just arrived because you were the now the newest lieutenant in the squadron and I could turn over custody of Boomer to you. I can't even imagine what it was like you and I meeting for the first time because like when I first got to the Air Force, I was already cynical. So... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I thought this was going to surprise you. I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect. I, I think okay. There's a new. <laughs> somebody said there's a new guy. I'm like a new guy. Really? I'm interested in a new guy. I got a handoff boomer. And like oh, okay, <laughs> well he works in such and such a flight. You can find him over there. I'm like great. I don't think I even like was going to tell you where it was at. I brought it with me. Like I was ready to get rid of this thing. <laughs> That's awesome. So I show up. Um, I show up at your desk and I have it in my custody and. I, I gotta, I gotta be honest, Josh. 
I really wasn't interested in learning your name or getting to know you or meet you or anything <laughs> like that. I just wanted to get rid of Boomer. So I'm like, hey, welcome to Squadron. Let me tell you about this thing. And I handed it off to you. That's my inflection point. I'm going to go to that inflection point because I don't know what happened then that like led to us becoming or not becoming friends or what future interactions we had after that. But let's just say you decided that that was not acceptable, that like I wasn't interested in you or your name or anything like that. I was just hazing you and you wrote me off and we never became <laughs> friends after that. So that's the inflection point. But here's where I'm going with this. Fast forward two years. I'm, at, I'm sitting at work one day and um, my wife is at home with our son. We only have one car at the time. So I'll, I'll say, let's, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think how to set this up. Uh, at the time that this event happened, I had your car, your black Mustang Cobra, because yes. you were in Afghanistan and you'd given it to me just to drive while you were away. Yes. So my phone at my desk rings, I pick it up. It's my wife. And she says, honey, your son just swallowed a straight pin. And I'm like, like a, like a sewing pin. Yeah, like like a sewing pin, the kind that are like straight and pointy and have a little ball, a colored ball on the end. Yes. I'm like, how would you even know that he did that? And she said, he was. I'd left the pin cushion out. I saw him playing with it. I looked over. I saw him pop it in his mouth. I ran over and tried to sweep his mouth, and it was gone. Oh, geez. Yeah, that's bad news bears. So because I had your car... I ran out, jumped in your car, drove home, took him to the hospital, got him the medical attention he needed. They took an x-ray. Sure enough, there it was in his stomach. I had to drive to a different location and got um, a pediatric gastroenterologist. They knocked him out, sent a scope down his throat, came out and handed me a film canister with this pin in it and three Barbie shoes because apparently he was eating <laughs> objects all day. <laughs> That's the best part of this story. <laughs> they, they, we go in for a pin and came out with five toys <laughs> <laughs> okay so alternate universe alternate universe i pissed you off that day you and i never became friends i don't have your car and my son dies because of complications due to surgery of it, it, in me not having adequate transportation to get him the medical attention he needed in time wow that is super dark that's a dark place to take it and the Okay, this is a that's a hardcore story, and I appreciate you telling it. And because I'm such a jerk and so cynical, I get I'm hanging I'm hung up on one detail. You were able to like find a pediatric gastroenterologist. Is that what you said? Gastroenterologist. Yeah. Gastroenterologist. Gastroenterologist. How many calls a day does that guy get? Like one a month? <laughs> like what does he do? I don't know. How like, many kids are swallowing straight pins? And maybe enough. They had the tools. I guess kids swallowing things is a. I, I just never figured there was a guy that's like, you know what? I'm gonna make my fortune on kids swallowing tiny plastic things. <laughs> yeah. So. Man, that is yeah. a dark place if, to go. Yes. If and, if if you weren't my friend. In 2007, my son might have died. Ben, I'm not going to lie. I, I totally use you. Like, you see that as this this wonderfully selfless thing that I did. All I can remember is I'm going to deploy for six months and I have this car. And I know if I let this car sit in one spot and never move for six months, it's either going to get stolen, the tires are going to be gone, the engine's going to be ripped out, some rat is going to nest in the engine and chew every cable and thing out of there. Like, I need somebody to take this car. But I don't want to just give it to somebody that's going to take it street racing or like, you know, Tokyo drifting in the middle of the night or whatever. And so. I, oh, no. I'm, I'm the boring person that you knew you could give it to and like, not have to worry. You know what? I know somebody that's super responsible, like not lame, but like like lame in the way that you want them to be lame when you're talking about bar let, letting them use your car. And like he's only got the van for all of his like himself and all his kids. This. He can totally use the car. Yeah, <laughs> it totally was. And and you know what? For a while, I felt like I had my midlife crisis car. You know, it was this <laughs> black Mustang with shiny wheels, and I was cruising around in it. And other lieutenants would give me a hard time, like, "Hey, what's with the Mustang?" <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the best part about? I I still I, I have very very fond memories of that car. But do you know what the best part of that car was? And Go. yes, this this was it was uh, like a mid two thousands jet black Mustang, but it's it was not a Cobra. It was the stripped down most basic V six yeah, that you could get. And I put and me being Mister cynical narcissist cocky bastard over here, 
I paid to have the Cobra wheels put on it. And then mm. everybody after that point, I would drive by like, oh, man, nice car. And I'm like, thanks. It's the most basic <laughs> V6 you can get. And then I drove off at a reasonable speed because that's all I could do. You picked me to drive that car because I was boring. <laughs> <laughs> Not because you were boring. Like, I, I love it. I knew you would take great care of it, and I knew you could use it. Like, there was well, there was some altruism. The, All I'm saying is there was a lot more selfishness in my decision than you're letting on. The only time I drove that car like a maniac was when my son was in the backseat digesting a straight pin. <laughs> Completely warranted. You're totally fine. All right. That's outstanding. No, that's it. That's that's it. That's the end of it. Let's go ahead and I'm going to keep driving this thing and we're going to wrap I it up. I enjoyed exploring alternate timelines. We need to do this again sometime. <laughs> so, yes, um, this, this is, ladies and gentlemen, the darkest timeline that we're living in. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch Community. It's on Netflix and Hulu, apparently. Season 3, Episode 4, Remedial Chaos Theory. Yeah, I felt like I was able to watch it without having watched the previous three seasons. Like, I, I was able to just get what was going on and enjoy it. Yeah, like, you don't really need to know the characters to pick up on the jokes. Yeah. Anyway, but that this is the darkest timeline. Everybody grow a goatee because this is evil Earth now. Just embrace the evil. Just, you know what, we'll all be happier for it. It's like, of course there's rioting. Of course there's political nonsense. Of, of course, course the president hates veterans. Of course the entire continent of Australia was on fire for a whole month. Like, of course that happened. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you to all of our listeners. We very much appreciate everything. That, like We love producing this content, and we we very much appreciate you listening to it. Um, please engage with us on any of your the social media platform of your choice. Um, ben does an excellent job keeping up a good Facebook page. We have a Reddit thread with a bunch of different comments and back and forth and discussions that we have on there. Um, if you want to tweet us or if you want to get on Instagram, good luck. We don't have those. <laughs> I do want to give one quick push for an important thing. Okay, uh, we're planning on doing a Q and A uh, episode in episode twenty nine. So we're gonna we're gonna be doing that in two weeks. So by the time you hear this episode, you'll have about a week and a half uh, before we actually record that. So we've opened an open thread on Reddit where you can go in and put your questions in anonymously, or you can go on Facebook and put them in non anonymously. Either way, or email us off the website. Whatever you want to do, get us your questions for episode twenty nine. And no question is too outlandish to be fielded. If you ask us what is the meaning of life, universe, and everything, well, we're going to say 42. But if you ask us big open-ended questions that couldn't possibly be answered, well, we're going to give it a shot anyway. You bet. Um, if you like, right. if you love what we do, recommend us to a friend. If you just can't get enough of us and you want us to do this forever, show us some love on Patreon. We very much appreciate everybody that does. Thank you to all of our patrons. I think that's a wrap. Thanks. Good episode 28. Thanks for letting me drive, Ben. Don't worry, everyone. We'll let Ben drive episode 29 so things will make sense again. <laughs>